All right, good morning, Trinity. It's good to have you with us this morning. Hey, wherever you're at this morning, we welcome you. Welcome to your church online. Let's go ahead and worship the Lord together today. He's alive this morning, we celebrate. See the tomb where he lay. See the stone rolled away. He is risen, he is risen, he's alive. See his hands, see his feet, touch the scars and believe. He is risen, he is risen, he's alive. Oh. All honor and power are His. All glory forever, Amen. Jesus is. Hear the shackles breaking free. Hear the song of the redeemed. He is moving. He is moving. He's alive. This freedom, take this love. Can you feel it rising up? He is here, he is here, he's alive. He lives all honor and power are his, all glory forever. morning of the gospel that he took our shame he left it in the grave you took all our shame left it in the grave we're forgiven yes we are we're forgiven the work forever done only by the blood it is finished it is finished you took all our shame left it in the grave we're forgiven oh we're forgiven the work forever done only by the blood it is finished oh it is finished all honor and power are His. All glory forever, Amen. Jesus, He lives. All honor and power are His. All glory forever, Amen. This he is risen. He is risen. He is risen. He's alive. Do you believe that this morning? He is risen. He is risen. He's alive. Amen. And that's the truth this morning that he lives today, and that is our hope. Let's join Marty for some announcements this morning.
Good morning. May the joy of the risen Christ be yours today. Why don't you join me in prayer, please? Father God, we thank you that you are our anchor in times of worry, in times of uncertainty, even in times of impatience. So this morning, Lord, we cling to you firm and fast, and we thank you that you hold to us even more tightly. Father, our souls are hungry for you this morning, and so we come with them open, waiting to be fed. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to remind you that this morning uh, we will be celebrating communion together. So if you have not gotten your communion supplies together, go do that now. We'll do that after a couple of more worship songs. Also, I want to thank you for continuing to give. We, uh, we are so grateful for the ability to continue to do the ministry that we are able to do, as well as to support our mission partners. And yesterday, we got a number of photographs from folks in Liberia. As you may recall, we sent several thousand dollars there to buy food for them because they were having a severe food shortage. And there are photographs of women carrying big bags of rice over their heads, hoping to feed their families for a month with those. And there's a precious picture of some women holding a sign that says, thank you, Trinity Bible Church, we love you. We are praying for all of you in the U.S. We've posted all of those photos on our Facebook page, so please go take a look at those today and pray for our friends in Liberia. And finally, I want to ask you to do one thing for us as soon as you possibly can, maybe today after you finish worshiping. Uh, we sent a survey to everyone who is on our emailing list because we would like to know how you're doing. We want to know what your needs are spiritually, physically, financially, emotionally. We want to know uh, how you feel about coming back to church when we're able to meet together. Uh, and there are a number of questions, not a lot, but a few that we've asked that would really help us as we make decisions about going forward. So if you have not done that yet, please do it. It's a really simple thing. You email it back to us. If you did not get it, you can find a link to it on our Facebook page or email tr info at trinitybible.org, and we will send you another one. Thank you. All right, as we continue worship this morning, let's, uh, wherever you're at, let's go to the Lord and just ask that he would speak to us this morning, that he would be glorified. Father, we, uh, God, we just want to pause this morning and recognize that we gather for you. God, we gather because of you. And uh, so, God, we thank you that your spirit is with us in all the different locations we're at this morning. God, you're here in this room. God, you're here in the living rooms, the offices of everyone that is watching online this morning. And uh, God, we just want to, um, by your spirit, come together and worship you. And Father, we want, uh, God, just to bring an uh, uh, offering of praise this morning. We want to, to give you the glory that you deserve. God, we want to honor you. Um, so Father, we pray that you would speak to us today. God, we pray that you as we lift you up, God, that you would, uh, God, just draw every heart to yourself this morning and, uh, and speak to us in a new and fresh way. God, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to worship this morning. Darkness tries to rule over my bones And sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. 
I am not a captive to the lies Not afraid I'm not afraid to leave my past behind No, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken My feet doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My feet doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My feet doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love there's power sing it with me there's power that can break off every chain there's power that can empty out a grave there's resurrection power that can save there's power in your name power in your name there's power that can break off every chain There's power that can empty out a grave There's resurrection power that can save There's power in your name Power in your name My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Where you at this morning? Sing it out. Oh, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Oh, standing in your love. Oh, standing on the rock. Standing There's a grace when the heart is on the fire I know the way when the walls are closing in But when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me, there was another in the waters, holding back the seas. Should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free? There is a cross that bears a burden, where another died for me. There is another in the fire. He took our debt, our sin, it's paid for. All my dead left the dead beneath the waters. I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. And should I fall in the space between where it remains of me and this reckoning? Either way, I will bow to the things of this world. Oh, I know, I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the waters holding back the seas. 
And should I ever need reminding What power set me free There is a grave that holds nobody And that power lives in me There is another in the fire There is another in the fire There is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in the fire. Oh, and I can see the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to him. I can feel the glow in the heavens as the space between west and Feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in. Nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between us. I sing the name of Jesus. There is no other name. There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come on, make the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. Let's sing it out. I know. I know I will never be alone There'll be another in the fire Standing next to me There'll be another in the waters Holding back the sea And should I ever need reminding How good you've been to me I count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be And I can see the light in the darkness As the darkness bows to Him I can hear the roar in the heavens As the space between west and I can feel the ground shake beneath us As the prison walls cave in Nothing stands between us Nothing stands between us. We're not alone this morning. He is with us. Sing this out, baby. Another in the fire. Standing next to me. There'll be another in the waters. Holding back the sea. Should I ever need reminding of good you've been to me? I count the joy come every battle, cause I know that's where you'll be. I count the joy come every battle, cause I know that's where you'll be. I count the joy come every battle, cause I know that's where you'll be. Hey, good morning, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Uh, we want to take a few minutes and celebrate communion together. Uh, you know, when you flip back through the Gospels and you watch the life of Jesus as he moves around, uh, he is, he's always eating with people. He's showing up at their houses and eating. He, he has breakfast with some guys out on the beach. He, they have snacks wandering through the cornfields. He shows up at weddings and eats there. He, he's just constantly moving about eating and, and dining and Having meals with folks, which is kind of cool when you flip over to Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, uh, there's, there's just this really interesting verse that's plugged in there, and Jesus is speaking, and he says, look, he says, here I am, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears me and opens the door, I will come in, and I will eat with him, and he with me. 
And, and it's this idea that Jesus is standing at the door and he's knocking. And if we just open up the door, he'll come in and we'll share a meal together. Which is really beautiful as we're coming together for communion. You're not here in the auditorium like we are. You're at home. Can you imagine that you're at home? And while you're sitting there in your den or your living room or out on the deck, all of a sudden there's this, or the doorbell rings, and Jesus is at the door. And the whole idea is you can see him through the little window. You, you know it's Jesus. And you get to choose. Will I open the door and have him come on in? And if he comes in, he's going to sit down and have, have a meal with you. He, and, and that's communion. That's the invitation this morning. It, it's the idea that Jesus right now is knocking, not just at the door of your house, but the door of your heart, and basically saying, look, if you'll just open up, if, if you'll create a little space, I'll come in and we'll eat together, we will fellowship together, we'll have relationship together. Communion is not just some empty ritual that we do. It's not something we do over and over again because Jesus told us to. This is a moment where we can pause in the living Savior. The hope of our lives will come and meet with us and us with Him. So we're going to celebrate communion. Let me give you a few seconds to gather your stuff together. Make sure you've got it. Make sure everybody has what they need. And, and so why don't you just take a moment, gather the items. The, the bread reminds us of his body that's broken. The cup reminds us of his blood that was poured out that introduces a whole new relationship with him that's no longer about how we perform, but it's about what he has done for us on the cross. And, and as, you, as you pick up those elements and you look at them, would you just maybe take a minute and just open your heart a little bit. Say, Jesus, would you come on in and meet with me right now? Let's eat together. So do that. writes to us in 1 Corinthians 11 and he basically says he's giving to us what Jesus gave to him and he talks to us about communion in this moment that we're in the middle of together and he, and he says look for I've received from the Lord what I also am passing on to you that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed he took the bread and after he had given thanks he broke it so maybe just for a second why don't you just pause and say Thank you, Lord, for what you've done. And then break or tear whatever bread you have. And then Jesus says to us, This is my body, which I gave up to be broken for you. Do this in remembrance of how much I love you. Now let's eat together. you have, whatever it is, or juice, wine, whatever it is that you have that with you this morning. And it tells us that after, in the same way, after supper, 
Jesus picked up a single cup that they all passed around, but we all have individual cups. And he tells us, this is the cup of the new covenant. That This is the cup of a new relationship between me and you. And it's the cup of his blood poured out for us. He says, he says, whenever you do this, whenever you drink it, to remember that this was the act of love that poured out his blood for you so that you could be washed clean, so that you could walk, walk into a new relationship with him, so that his Holy Spirit would fill you and live through you, and you could eat with him, not just once a month at communion, but every day of your life, forever and ever. Let's drink together. Well, Jesus, thank you so much for meeting with us this morning in the middle of this meal, in the middle of this communion. And, and Lord, not just here, not just in this moment, but all day long. Thank you so much. That, that you died for us because you love us. That you long to meet with us, to dine with us, to fellowship with us, to have relationship with us. Lord Jesus, thank you for this promise that you said that, that you, after you drank that night, after you drank the wine that night, you weren't going to drink it ever again until we were all gathered together in heaven in your presence. And so, Lord, I know from what you've written and said that you long for that day as well. And that you are hoping and you are waiting and looking forward to that day when we will all be in your presence. And that the whole family will not be gathered back just in their individual churches, but we will all be together in your presence. So thank you, Lord, for this reminder of the price you paid for us to have a relationship with you. Now, Lord, we're going to open up your word. I pray that you would speak to us this morning. Lord, wherever we are, are or however we're scattered, uh, whatever we're going through, I pray that you would have a unique and special word for every one of us. And that we would sense your love through the songs we're singing, through the communion we're eating, through the message we're hearing, and through the loved ones you've given us. Lord, would you draw near to us? In your very precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys, set your cups or trays or everything, whatever, out of the way. And, and uh, we're going to take a minute and open up God's Word together. <clears throat> and so uh, we're in the middle of this series on hope as the anchor of our souls. And as we get started this morning, uh, really kind of wherever you are, I'd like to ask you a question. And I want you to answer this if you can. Okay, and you can answer it out loud if there's some people you're there, or you can answer it out loud if you're by yourself. That's kind of what I tend to do. I just talk to myself all day. Often it's the best, you know, it's the most intelligent conversation I have. But, but uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, but wherever you are, whether you're out on the deck or whatever, you're with family, you're alone, I... I, I I would like you to take a moment and, and think through this question. And here, here's the question, okay? And, and, and the question is, how, how would you finish this statement? All right? How would you finish this statement? I wish this quarantine lockdown would end so I can. So, so what would you say? I, I want this season we're in, this quarantine, this shelter in place, to end so that I can. Take a second. What's your answer? Do you have an answer? Do you have 10? Are you going to run out of time in a hurry? Are you able to finish that one? I, I, I think you probably were. I mean, more and more as I talk to everybody, everybody says, I just can't wait for everything to get back to normal. I just can't wait for this to be over so I can do this or I can do that or I can go here or I can't go there. And we all want our lives to somehow come back to some sense of normalcy, which probably just means we want to be back in control, or at least we have an illusion of that. And so we're, we're constantly saying, I can't wait till this is over so. But, but I wonder, you know, I, I wonder if you can remember two months ago, just think back two months ago, you know, to, to early March or back into February, before all this all got started, if I were to ask you that same question two months ago, what would you have said? 
I can't wait for this to be over, whatever that may be, so that I can. Right? What did you want to end two months ago so that you could do whatever it was you were hoping to be able to do? You know, every family has their own birthday and Christmas culture. culture. The one I grew up in at home, back in my parents, whatever it was, birthday or Christmas, whoever the honoree was, all of the presents were stacked in front of them. And, and you'd have a pile of, you know, whether it was one, two, ten, whatever it may be. You know, if it was Christmas, everybody had their individual piles. If you're the birthday boy or girl, you had your pile. And then all of a sudden, it was kind of like, go, and we'd rip all the presents, all the paper off. You'd go from one present to the next present to the next present to the next present. You'd race your way through that, but without so much as hardly a thank you or even acknowledging who gave it to you. You know, when Susan and I started our own family, tried to create a different culture, you know, so we'd have a little more gratitude, so we would give one present at a time you know, maybe from the actual person who gave it to you, and the idea is that you'd unwrap it, and you'd look at it, and you'd be able to make eye contact or say thank you, thank you, thank you, whatever it was. But it, but it really didn't change that, that it was the season of getting. And, 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 and the kids were racing through their presents, really only to get to the next present, to get to the next present, to get to the next present. And, and uh, because we're always in a hurry to get to this next thing, whatever it may be, thinking it, the next thing is going to be the thing that's going to finally satisfy everything that we long for. And we have this deep longing inside of us now to get back to normal, to get out of where we are now, this moment, and to get to normal, to somehow find this new thing so that we can race from this thing to the next thing as if that's going to take care of it. But I would bet that two months ago, wherever you were in your life, that you were somehow thinking, I can't wait for this to end I can't wait for this soccer season to end so I have more free time. I, I can't wait where I can stop running from practice to rehearsal to meeting, you know, and we're cramming our days full, wishing they would slow down. And now all of a sudden they're slowed down and we say, I can't wait for our days to stop being so slow so I can get back to whatever we were doing. Maybe two months ago you were saying, I really wish I could spend more time with my kids. <laughs> Maybe today you're thinking, I really wish my kids would go back to school, you know. Uh, we, we, we tend to run through life like a kid at a birthday party, unwrapping this, 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 this thing, and, and racing to the next thing, thinking that the next thing is going to be the thing that satisfies us finally. And at the end of the party, end of the season, we all ask, is that all there is? Is that all the presents? Is that all the seasons? Is that all the stuff? Is, is that all there is? And we kind of wonder sometimes, is, is that all there is? And as a result... We are rarely satisfied with whatever we're in the middle of. And I don't tell you that to shame you. Please don't hear that. I tell you that to, to make this observation and try to surprise you somewhat. God made you that way. Did you hear me? God made you that way. He, he made us to be always hungry for something we don't yet have. He, he made us in such a way that we're always wanting more than we currently have. He, he's made us so that we're always missing something. We're always longing for something that is not quite there. We want to be the person we are not quite yet. And, and so we always, God made you to have this unsatisfied desire for more, for something, for something different. And to be always asking this question, God designed you to always be asking the question, is that all there is? Is that all there is? Don't miss it. God made you that way. Now, this morning, what I want to do is kind of pursue that idea. So I'm going to invite you to grab your Bible, turn over to Romans chapter 8. Romans is in the middle of the New Testament. It's about 16 chapters, so it's not too difficult to find if you're just flipping along. And, and it's about 90% of the way through your Bible, somewhere 85 90%. And, and, and Romans chapter 8 is this wonderful passage filled with all kinds of truths and promises. But I want you to flip over to Romans chapter 8, and if you've found it, I want you to let your eyes slip down to, chapter, to verse 24. And in, in verse 24 and 25 is this question that hope asks. Okay, take a look if you would. Verse 24 it says, For in this hope, we'll talk about more of that in a minute, in this hope we were saved. 
But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have, right? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Hope is a longing for something we do not yet have. Hope is this desire, this unsatisfied restlessness inside of us that longs for something we are not yet experiencing. And so if you want to phrase it a different way, the question that hope asks is this. What do I want that I don't currently have? What do I want that I don't currently have? Hope is always stirring up inside of you, this longing for something you don't have. And, and, and so, so and it's always that, because even if your hope is anchored in Christ, there is still something you're longing for. That's what he said at the very beginning of verse 24. You know, in this hope, we were saved. We were saved by Christ, entered into a relationship with Christ, and yet we are still longing for something we don't yet have. It's something beyond, something more, something that says, is that all there is? And, and so hope is this word of longing. As we're in this series on hope as the anchor of our souls, you've got to understand that this idea of hope is a longing inside of us for something more than we currently have, where we're, where we're wanting more because we're not yet satisfied. There's something we haven't, be, some person we haven't become yet some place we haven't gone, some, some, some thing we haven't attained. So what is it that you want that you don't currently have? What is it you want? The fact that you want it tells us that you don't have it yet. What is it you want? Maybe in that moment you're immediately thinking, something real tangible, you want a job, you, you, you want the freedom to go out to eat or go out someplace, maybe you want a new pony or a new car or a new friend, you know, or maybe there's something else, maybe you want the approval of a parent that you just would never give it to you, you know, maybe you want the love of the spouse you gave your heart to, maybe you want your, your kids to turn to Christ in some meaningful way. You know, may, maybe you want some craving of the heart. It's not just a thing. See, hope is always the longing for something you don't yet have. And God designed you to want those things. See, that kind of speaks to us about the nature of hope. Let me give you, I'm going to give you Three quick realities of hope, truths that are always true when we talk about hope. And, and the first one is this, and it really flows out of these two verses we just read, that, it, that hope always has a future expectation. <clears throat> hope is always looking to the future. Always, it, it's always out in the future. It's not really focused on the now. Hope makes a difference in how we live in the now, but it is focused on the future. It is always, there's some expectation out there beyond this current moment that, that it draws us to you know it, it's always someplace i haven't yet gone it's something i haven't yet experienced it's something i am longing for and it's out there we're kind of going man i'm hoping i'm you know and the way it's written in the scriptures i know it's coming but it's not here yet and, and that's what he says with verse 25 he says if we hope for what we do not yet have hope is the longing for what i don't yet have and so we're hoping for something in the future, someday in the future, some, some, something. And so hope always lifts our eyes to the far horizon. It always makes us look out a ways and long for something out there. And so hope is a constant reminder that it's out there, not here. There's a second reality here, and, and that hope is always marked by struggle. We've talked about it the last two weeks in a row, is that hope... You know, when, when things are going along swimmingly and your life is just sailing, hope is really not what, what comes to the surface for you. But when there's struggle, when there's hardship, when there is suffering, it's in that moment that hope begins to well up inside of you because hope is, is forged 
in the midst of the struggle. Hope is the answer to the struggle. And, and hope is what gets us through the struggle because it reminds us where we are now is not the end of the story. This hardship right now is not the end of the story. And, and so hope and struggle are always connected at the hip. Hope and struggle and hardship are always wed together. Is, is, and it always is that case. And so hope is, always has a future expectation. Hope is always marked by struggle. And finally, hope is never fully satisfied in this life. That's what we've been talking about. Right? I mean, it's the question that Paul asks. Who hopes for what they already have? If you have it, you don't hope for it. If you have it, you don't look for it. And, and so hope is always about something that we don't yet have. Look again at verse 24. Look closely at this. See what it says? For in this hope, which is something we don't yet have, we were saved. When he talks about being saved, what he's talking about is coming into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, the first seven chapters of this whole book has all been about this, how our relationship with God was broken because we said, well, we don't care about you, God, and we want our own way. And then it talked about how there's nothing we can do to mend that relationship with God. We can't make ourselves good enough. We can't make ourselves nice enough. We can't love enough. We can't earn our way back to God. There's nothing we could do. But God wanted that relationship. So instead of us trying to make our way to God, God came down to us. Jesus took on humanity. And he, and he died for us on the cross. And, then it was, and, it, and he makes it really clear. He it says it's not what you do. It's simply that you trust what Jesus has done. And you enter into this love relationship with God. We talked about it two weeks ago. We have peace with God. We have access to God. There's no condemnation from God anymore. And, and, and so what he's saying is it, you were saved, but not yet satisfied. You were saved, but, there is, but even as you entered into this relationship with God, there was this hope for something else in the future that you were made for. So we still hope. And, and, and he says, makes it really clear that that. But hope that is seen, if you have it, if you can touch it, if you own it, it's not hope at all. Hope is for something you don't yet have. It is still something that you can't quite see, that you don't quite fully experience. And, and, and so hope is this longing for a different world. If this world can't satisfy, then it's a clue that we were actually made for something different. We were made for something more, and God put that in there. And so even though hope has this huge, uh, you know, this future orientation, and we're kind of looking to the future, we're hoping and longing for that, it also makes a difference for right now. So I want to take a couple of minutes and give you three tangible impacts that hope makes, if you're anchored in Christ, that it makes in your life right now. So if you're in the middle of this struggle, let me tell you what hope does. And I could have probably put a dozen different things. I just picked three for the sake of time. Okay, and the first thing is this, is when your hope is anchored in Christ, it gives you peace in the midst of the struggle. It gives you peace in the midst of the struggle. And on your, on your outline, if you're having to look at that, I noted Psalm 131. And you can turn there now if you want to, you can turn there later. But, but it's this wonderful little three-verse psalm. And, and as it's written, the, the final verse of the psalm says this, it says, Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore. Trust Him. Put your hope in Him. Lean on Him. Hope in the Lord. And the reason is, verse 2, what He tells us in verse 2 is this. Listen, He says, But I have calmed, I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. What He says is this is that when we put our hope in the Lord, we trust Him for our now and our future, we begin to experience a peace that's just like a baby that has just nursed and fallen asleep in its mother's arms. You know what we say about that? When we look at something and the little angelic face of the baby asleep in his mother's arms, what we end up saying is, man, he looks like he doesn't have a care in the world. And he doesn't. That little baby, he or she is content, at peace, oblivious to the cares of the world. And, and what, what the psalmist is writing here, he says, when you put your hope in the Lord, 
you're just like this baby that you can curl up in the arms of God and be oblivious to the cares of the world. You can be at peace just like this baby. That baby's not laying there thinking about its next meal. It's not there thinking about who's going to change my diaper. It's not thinking about how will there ever be. No, that baby snuggles in and nestles in and is so completely at peace, nothing else matters. And what the psalmist is saying is, hey, put your hope in the Lord. Put all these longings you have in the Lord. Trust him with it. And there is a peace that passes all understanding in the midst of the chaos. And then you can begin to live as if you don't have a care in the world. Because you don't. He's got it taken care of. And, and, and by the way, it, it, if, you're, if you're like me and you get caught up in the anxieties of the world, man, it's just a flag that goes off that says, my hope is no longer in Jesus. I put it somewhere else. My soul is no longer anchored in Jesus because if I have a care in the world, I'm figuring there's something here that I've got that's going to take care of me as opposed to being snuggled up in the arms of Jesus. And so the first thing that hope produces in you is a peace. The second thing it produces in you is a renewed strength. It renews your strength. And over in the book of Isaiah, listen to what he writes. This is a pretty famous verse. You may know this. But over in Isaiah, verse 30, he says, Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. And it's this whole idea that, that, that if you're young and you're fit and you're healthy, and, and this idea of if, if even the young and the healthy get tired, then I'm going to get tired. You know, and, and, and we are tired. You're tired right now. You know, you're tired from all the Zoom meetings and you're tired of having to have everybody in the house and you're tired of trying to homeschool your kids and you're trying to, tired of trying to figure out how to work from home and you're tired about all the stress that comes from the oil field. And we are tired. The whole idea, he says, and, and even if the youths grow tired and weary and the young men stumble and fall, and if they do, you will. And he says this, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will, not, they will walk and not be faint. And what he says is, it, it, when I put my hope in the Lord, when I put my hope in the promises of God and the character of God, I am rejuvenated. I am re-energized. I am given a new and a fairest strength to face whatever my day faces today. When I'm hoping in him, I have this renewed energy to, to step into it again, to walk into this day or that day or this meeting or that meeting or this struggle or that struggle. That, that, that when our hope is anchored in Christ, there is an, a renewed strength. It, you know, it, it, it's like the battery is recharged and I'm able to step into this again. And, 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 and it's this whole idea that that where I'm, where I'm tired in my life, I experience a fresh energy. Where I'm beaten down, I am lifted up. Where I'm frustrated, I experience this whole new set of patience. When I'm angry, my, 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 my peace is renewed. When, when I'm sad and distressed, my joy is, is recharged because I have my hope in the Lord. And so putting my hope in the Lord renews my strength for whatever I'm facing today. Now, look, we've talked about this before, but I always feel like this passage is written backwards. I feel like the, the climax of the verse, that, you know, you know and, and you, you walk and then you run and then you soar like an eagle. But, you know, because it just seems like the culmination is wrong. We should end up soaring. But I think the emphasis of the passage is right. I mean, what is harder? To soar on, e on eagle's wings when life is going well? Or to just keep plodding when life is hard. To just put one foot doggedly in front of the other and not give up. It's easy to rejoice on the day of your child's birth. Man, it's tough to rejoice on the day your teenage daughter comes home and tells you she's pregnant. You know, it's easy to rejoice on the day you get the promotion. It, it, you come home with all kinds of energy. But where does the energy come from on the day you're told you were laid off? 
you just see, it's easy to soar when life's working. But when life is tough, the culmination of God's strength in you is just the ability to just keep walking day after day after day. And the real mark of victory is to just keep following God even in the middle of the struggle. Let me give you one third promise if I could. What hope does for you is transformation. Transformation. It, 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 it moves you. You become a new person. Look back at Romans 8 if, you, if you've got your Bible there in front of you. And I want you to look at verses 18 and 19. We haven't read those yet. And, and look at what he says. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Verse 19, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. See, it, it's not just that God gives you a peace in the midst of the cares. It's not just that God gives you strength to handle the struggles. It's that in the midst of the sufferings, you are being made new. And the way this is written is so beautiful because it says that our, our present sufferings compared to our future glory. And, and what he is suggesting is that who you are now is not who you will be. That you will be so beautiful, frankly, that we will all be tempted to worship you. That you will be so glorious. Matter of fact, anyone around you who knows Christ, it's the same promise. That we are not yet revealed for who we will be. You know, there's this interesting moment in the life of Jesus. And he goes up onto the Mount of Transfiguration. And, you know, this is God in a body. You know, he is walking around in this earth suit just like us. And he goes up onto the Mount of Transfiguration. And it's not long before he's going to head to the cross. And he goes up on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he takes up three of the guys, Peter, James, and John. And they're up there with him. It says that he meets with Moses and Elijah. They come and visit with Jesus as well. And it says in that moment, it's as if the earth suit was peeled back and his glory was so radiant they were just almost blinded by it. It's the same idea. Is that what you are now is your disguise. What you are now is merely the covering. What you are now is, is the cocoon in which you are being transformed. There will be a day when that will peel, be, be peeled back and your glory will be revealed to the point that we will be tempted to worship you in all of that. And every individual who has their hope anchored in Christ is being transformed and the day will come where they will look just like him. William Dyke went blind at the age of 10. As the years went by, he found himself in grad school when he was in grad school, he fell in love with an admiral's daughter. And they agreed to be married, and he asked the admiral, can I have your daughter in marriage? And she, he said, yes, he says, but with one provision. There's an experimental surgery that might heal your eyes. And before I consent to that, then you have to have the surgery. And William says, great, I'll take that deal, but I have a provision that I want to have the surgery timed so that I take off the gauze that are on my head in the middle of my wedding so that the first thing I see is the bride. So they set up the wedding and all the guests are there, all the parents come in and all the bridesmaids and the groomsmen are all in place and then they begin the processional of the bride. And as the admiral is walking his daughter down the aisle, William is up at the front and his dad is standing behind him slowly unraveling the gauze so that by the time his bride-to-be is standing right in front of him, the last gauze is removed from his eyes and everybody was speechless and they stood there. And, and then finally he spoke. <laughs> And he says, you are more beautiful than I ever imagined. Men and women, that's what Jesus is doing with us. There's going to come a day when we're going to be in his presence. 
and the gauze are going to come off. And he's going to look at you as his bride and say, you are more beautiful than I ever imagined. And you're going to look at Jesus and you're going to say, you are more beautiful than I ever imagined. And then you're going to look at your friends all around you and go, and you're more beautiful and you're more beautiful and we will be glorious. What hope is doing in you is transforming you into this glory, this beauty that we can't even imagine. So what do we do in the meantime? How do we live with this hope in this moment? Let me give you just three quick action steps, as I, if I can, that flow out of this passage. So what do we do? First, we wait. We wait. That's what he said in verse 25, isn't it? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Right now, we're in the time of waiting, and none of us like to wait. We're waiting for the governor to speak. We're waiting for life to get back to normal. We're waiting for all of this stuff, and we hate it. We're waiting for God to work in us and transform us and do all these things that we're waiting for. And Ecclesiastes has this beautiful little statement where it says that God makes everything beautiful in its time. And we are waiting for God's time to make all things beautiful. And it's not yet. But today we wait. And it says we wait patiently. Which is maybe a hope. But we wait patiently. Look, this year, Susan and I both turned 65. About 10 weeks apart. And, uh, and so somewhere, some months ago, we thought, let's do something special to commemorate our birthdays. And about that time, we realized that the Eagles were going to be in concert in Houston at almost the exact midpoint between our birthdays, and we said, we're going. And so months ago, months before the concert, we bought the tickets. We had the tickets, and we waited. And we'd look at the tickets and go, it's coming, but we're waiting. And we waited, and we waited, and the weeks went by. And then Debbie in the office had tickets, and Cindy had to tell. And, and so they're going one night, we're going another night, and we kept, hey, it's coming, but it's still forever. We're waiting, and we're waiting. And wait. finally, Susan and I drive to Houston. We get there way too early, so we're sitting in the hotel room, and we're waiting. So we couldn't stand it anymore, so we went on over to the arena, and we're sitting there, and we're way too early. We're sitting in our chairs, and we're waiting, and we're waiting. And then finally, the time for it to start comes. 8 o'clock rolls around, and they never start on time, just so you kind of build your anticipation. So we're sitting there, and we're waiting, and we're waiting, and we're waiting. And until finally, the guitar strums, and they break into Hotel California, and it is three hours of glory. It was incredible, and it was worth it the wait. We know the quarantine's going to end, but today we wait. We know sooner or later we're going to have real birthday parties for our kids, but today we wait. We know that it won't be long. We'll all be gathered here at the church together again, but today we wait. We know that God will transform us into this glory, but today we wait. We, we know that we're not satisfied with all that the world offers us, but there will be a day we will be satisfied. Today we wait. So what do we do now? We wait. Second thing we do is we trust. We trust the Lord. We, we trust Him. We trust His character. We trust who He is and what He is and what He has said, and we trust. He says He's going to make all things beautiful in its time. We trust. He, he, we, he says He has a future and a hope for us, and we trust. We, he, he says that I'm going to work these things out. To, I'm going to work. I'll weave all these things together for good, and we trust. He says that uh, that there will be a day. There will be a day when we will be satisfied, but it's not this day. There will be a day when our hopes will be fulfilled, but it's not this day. And we trust, and we trust the Lord to provide for us. And and so, by the way, if you haven't trusted Christ as your Savior yet, let me encourage you to do that today. Let me encourage you to trust him as the one who died for you on the cross. Then trust him with each and every day for your, of your life. And we trust. And then finally, we groan. It's kind of the theme of Romans 8. Look at back at verse 22. He says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And he says, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly. As a matter of fact, if you were to flip down to verse 26, it tells us that the Holy Spirit groans. And it's this whole idea of groaning while we wait. 
groaning is the language of hope. Groaning, this longing, this, this aching in our soul for something different is the language of heaven. It's the language of hope. Because groaning is, is, is like the blues of the cosmos. It is the, it is the song of all creation. It's the song that the created world sings. It is the song that we sing. It is the song that the Spirit sings. And we all sing this song of groaning because it is the song of longing. Look, I'm, I'm in fairly average, if you're, if you're kind, shape. You know, I, I walk three miles almost every day. Uh, and I've been doing that for months, and and uh, you know, so I, but over the last couple of months, like like most, I've been working in the yard like crazy. I'm on my fourth garden. You know, I've hauled more bags of dirt than I can even remember. And at the end of the day, or the start of the next, as I'm trying to unfold my body, the only response is to groan. Just, uh, there are no words. It's just the. Uh, because words won't do. It's what he's saying here. That there are no words for this longing. It's nothing more than we can do. We kind of go, oh, things aren't right. Oh, I wish things were different. And we groan, and creation groans, and God groans, and we are all waiting for something we don't yet have. And something that this world can never provide for us. Groaning, groaning is the longing for things to be made right. Things are the groaning is for the things for you to be made right. And we're waiting. Ultimately, groaning is homesickness. It is longing for a place where we are at home, and this world is not enough for us. Groaning is this reminder that no matter how much we accumulate how much status we have, how much position we have, it's still not enough. We were made for another world. And this longing and this groaning reminds us every day that there must be something different. There must be something more that this world can't satisfy. But only heaven can. Only the full presence of Jesus in our lives can truly satisfy. See, God has put in you a homing device that constantly draws you towards Him and towards heaven because we long to go home. And only home will satisfy. And only heaven, ultimately, is home. And so this longing, this hope, is the promise of a day when you will be fully satisfied in the presence of God. Let's pray. Hmm. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you are indeed good, that you are holy. Lord, there are days we wish you would not put that longing for more in us, that we could somehow be satisfied with what we have. But Lord, thank you that we never really are. That all of the good we have here is merely a taste, it's a hint, it's a rumor of what we were truly made for. And so, Lord, I pray that you would fuel our dissatisfaction until we find ourselves satisfied in you. Like Augustine said, Lord, we are restless until we rest in you. And so, Lord, I pray that this restlessness, this longing would draw every one of us into your presence until we find our satisfaction in you and not in all of the other accoutrements and stuff of our world. Lord, may we, may we be satisfied with you. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will come to each individual listening and that you would whisper in their ears and their hearts that you are enough. So Lord, we pray these things in your very precious name. Amen.
That was just the perfect com- conclusion for our service this morning. So I'm going to leave you with the blessing I've been le- leaving you with week after week. And it is this, that God will go before you to guide you, behind you to protect you, below you to lift you up, and above you to shield you. He will go beside you to be your friend, and he will go inside you to fill you up. There's no reason for fear. Do not be afraid. God is with you. So as you go out today to serve the, the, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, to serve your neighbors as well, go in peace without fear. God bless you guys. We love you. Can't wait till we're all back in here together again. Someday soon, I assume. So, all right. God bless. Have a great Sunday. We'll talk to you next week.